language and the sense for reality or its lack. On the basis of what I have given you in these lectures and in order to reaffirm it strongly, I want to start out today with this remark. It is notably in philology that the consequences of a materialistic approach are the saddest, but perhaps also the most obvious. We can say that materialistic methods probably do more harm, for instance, in physics, because there it is less obvious, but it is most saddening in connection with language. Just here <clears throat> this could have been most easily avoided. Just here it would have been possible to see how spirit and soul are actually at work in the language-forming genius. Now, with this insight, our task will be to approach the earlier periods of language forming by observing, first of all, what happens in later times. It is easier to survey the more recent happenings. You can follow language changes by noting how they shine through the accompanying changes in the feelings and perceptions of the folk soul. <clears throat> the language of the German people, around the time of the Minnesingers, the Minnesingers, historians call it the age of chivalry, lies relatively far back, but not so far that one can't trace literary matters easily enough to clarify this or that shift of meaning. By that time you don't find as many uncomplimentary phrases and epithets as in Homer, whose heroes applied names to each other that we would call insulting. Today we would hardly call each other goat stomachs or donkeys. In those ancient times, however, a donkey was held in such esteem that a hero could be called a donkey. Animals, then, it is evident from the Homeric epics, were by no means the object of such nuances of feeling as they are today. We can <clears throat> come to some understanding of these things if we look for characteristic examples from a time close to ours. In the Middle Ages we find the figure of speech Sie klepten wie ein Pech an ihre feinde Scharen quote, They stuck like pitch to the ranks of the enemy, unquote. It sounds laughable today to say of a person who perseveres bravely in battle, quote, he sticks like pitch, unquote. but this expression was definitely used in the age of the Minnesingers. In Wolfram von Eschenbach you will find a characteristic figure of speech, showing us, first of all, what was considered important at the time, description through vivid images, and secondly, various nuances of feeling for things or processes that would today seem rather contemptuous. Footnote. Wolfram von Eschenbach, 1170 to 1220, German epic poet and knight, most famous work, title Parzival. End of footnote. When von Eschenbach describes in a serious manner a duchess coming toward a gentleman, he says, her appearance penetrated his eye, e -Y -E, and entered his heart. Wie eine Nieswurz durch die Nase, quote, like a sneezewort through the nose, unquote. This is a vivid metaphor, for the scent of sneezewort penetrates one's nose in a very lively way. One could even say, ruchbar, smellable. See lecture 2, page 30. But we would certainly not use the phrase today. It shows how the world of feeling has changed, and this change in the world of feeling must be studied in order to get at the science of language in a non-materialistic way. A more recent poet, as you know, was still able to say of a dignified woman, sie blickte wie ein Vollmond drein. Quote, her glance was like the full moon, unquote. Footnote Ludwig Uhland, 1787 to 1862, in Des Sängers Fluch. End of footnote. But this figure of speech, quite usual in the Middle Ages, would be inexcusable today. If you were prompted by a similar emotion to explain, exclaim this, in, excuse me, read that again. If you were prompted by a similar emotion to exclaim in this way to a lady, it would hardly be polite. In the Middle Ages, however, the loveliness and gentleness of the moon were transcendent in the hearts of the people. It was from this point of view that the association came about 
of the full moon with the beloved qualities of a lady's glance and countenance. Gottfried von Strasburg speaks in his title Tristan quite seriously about geleimte Liebe, glued love, as something that had come apart and then found its way together again. Footnote Tristan and Isolde, uh, A.D. twelve ten approximately. End of footnote. He spoke too about kleben bleiben, quote, quote, staying glued down unquote, of wounded men on the battlefield. This would sound insulting today. When people in the Middle Ages described the kaiserlichen Beine, quote, imperial legs unquote, of a person, in order to express his stateliness, or the kaiserliche Macht Maria, quote, the imperial maid Mary, unquote, it points up essential aspects of change within the world of feeling. In bringing you these examples, I want you to become observant as to how these subtle changes of feeling show up in obscure areas. For instance, one could speak in those early ages of Kankem Schilfro, sick, or quote, sick reeds, unquote. What are sick reeds? Krank, sick, is here only a descriptive adjective for an exceedingly long, thin reed. And it is not at all far back in time when krank had no other meaning than slim. In those days when you called a person krank, you would have meant that he was tall and slim, certainly not that he was ill, in the present sense of the word. Had you wished to express sick, you would have used the term süchtig, von einer Sucht befallen, in modern usage, quote, chronically ill or addicted. To be krank was to be thin. Just think what has happened to this word. Gradually the feeling developed that it is not quite human to be thin. The notion has been adopted that a normal human being would be a little bit more substantial, would be a little more substantial. With this detour came about the linking of the sound connection krank with the meaning sick and the idea of a not quite normal organism. We see how a word with one distinct shade of meaning can take on a very clearly different one. <clears throat> not very long ago, an innkeeper could do a good business by advertising Ellenden, quote, miserable, unquote, wine. He could trumpet forth in his village, quote, in my inn you get Ellenden, Ellenden wine, unquote. It is exactly the same word that means miserable today. Now, however, only in a dialect will you still find an echo of the old shade of meaning, where certain villages lying far out toward the border of the land are called the Elend villages. Even in my time, in Styria, in southern Austria, someone saying, Der Mann ist aus dem Elend. Parenthesis, the man is from the Elend. And close parenthesis, meant that he came from a village on the border. Certain villages have kept the name Elend up to the present day. This term has actually moved in from farther away, for Ellender, wine, meant ausländischer wine, foreign, outlandish. Elend is the Ausland, quote, foreign country, unquote. So the innkeeper would have done good business, at least up to 1914, by advertising, say, French wines as Ellender wine. We see a shift of meaning similar to the one in Kank. The poet Geiler von Kaisersberg speaks most peculiarly of a hübschen, pretty god. He wouldn't say this today. We wouldn't say this today, but if you look it up in his works, you will find it more understandable. Footnote Geiler von Kaisersberg, 1445 to 1510, famous preacher. End of footnote. He meant with this a benevolent god, hübsch at that time carried the same shade of feeling as kind. Aside, an English example when James II, 1633 to 1701, first saw St. Paul's Cathedral in London, he called it amusing, awful and artificial. He meant that it was pleasing to look at, meriting awe and full of skillful, skillful artifice. End of aside. You will still find occasionally today <coughs> surviving figures of speech, such as the phrase, ein Ungehobelter Mensch, quote, an uncouth person, unquote. Literally, quote, unplaned, 
unquote, surface, not smoothed with a hobel, a carpenter's plane. You will understand this word on meeting it in Martin Luther's writing, that people are gehobelt, planed smooth by the prophets, that is, that they are being put to rights, put in order, straightened up by the prophets. We find there the visual imagery of the act of planing with the, quote, making straight, unquote, in a moral sense. After these examples from so far back in time, we can look at something closer to us. Lessing, who lived more recently, wanted to describe the many things for which we rightfully develop great sympathy, but which, nevertheless, cannot be called beautiful or be thought of as objects of art. Footnote. Gotthold Ephraim Lessing, 1729-1781, to critic and dramatist. The quotation is from his play titled Emilia Galotti, Act One. Scene 4, and a footnote. By the way, he phrased this, we, it can easily be misunderstood today, quote, much of the anzu, anzuglichsten, anzuglichsten, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right, parenthesis, offensive, suggestive, lewd, in today's meaning, close parenthesis, cannot be an object of art. Aside, modern German uses another form of the verb anziehen, to draw or pull which is unseeant, which equals attractive, end of a side. Lessing means that many things of the most attractive nature cannot rightfully be called objects of art. In this word we have a real change on how the word is felt. We use the term nowadays for something essentially different. It is interesting to trace the complicated way such shifts of meaning take place. Consider how the word krank, meaning slim at an earlier time, might also be applied to a reed. <coughs> a reed is crank when it is slim, less useful than a short, thick one. This shade of meaning gradually changed then to its present sense of sick, though somewhat modified once again. Adelung, living halfway between that time and ours, speaks about gekränkte, ships that need repair. Aside gekränkte, the past participle of the verb kränken, introduces still another shade of meaning, Today it is used to mean hurt, in the sense of hurt feelings. End of aside, footnote, Johann Christoph Adelung, 1732 to 1806, German philologist and grammarian, court librarian at Dresden. End of footnote. <coughs> it strikes us as a little comic, or at least it characterizes the speaker as a joker, when someone talks about a hurt clock. But in those years the sense of the word was perfectly clear with its changed meaning, when applied to inorganic objects. Trank originally referred to the shape or form. The present meaning, sick, crept in only gradually. While the earlier meaning, slim, was cast aside altogether, and the totally new one took over, we are still reminded of the original meaning of the term hurt ships. The immediate sensing of the emotional, perceptive quality within words disappeared more and more. Even Goethe still had a clear feeling about words. He found feelings in words that nowadays leave us cold, for in many respects he went back to the power of the language-forming genius. The word bitter, bitter, for instance, has become for us a purely subjective tasting experience. Usually we don't connect it in our feeling with what in earlier times was clearly visualized as bison, to bite, from which it originates. The relationship is there. Whatever tastes bitter really bites us. Goethe still felt this and writes about, quote, the bitter scissors of the fates, unquote. Footnote in his poem, Hartsreise im Winter, Winter Journey in the Hearts, end of footnote. They are the biting scissors of the fates. People nowadays are such abstract creatures that they think this is mere poetic license. But it is not poetic license at all. It arose directly out of inner experience. True, Goethe did not yet live in a time when 99% of poetic writing is superfluous. We should keep in mind while reading his work how, within language, he felt a much greater aliveness, a more inward life than we are able to feel today as products of modern education. You can sense this too from Goethe's words, Ein ecce homo gefiel mir wegen seiner Erbärmliche Darstellung. Quote, 
an Ecce Homo painting, pleased him particularly because of its miserable portrayal. Unquote. No one today seems to feel that there is anything more in Goethe's phrase than the meaning of a poor sort of representation. But Goethe wants to suggest that our deepest pity is aroused through this particular portrayal. We would say, quote, Ein ecce homo gefiel, mir wegen seine Erbarmen her ans vor den, den sorry, Darstellung, end quote. quote. An ecce homo painting pleased me particularly because the portrayal aroused compassion. Unquote. Goethe was still able to put it, quote, because of its miserable portrayal, unquote. Not so very long ago, it was possible to say of a person who liked to speak with children or poor people on the street, who was not snobbish or conceited, for whom one wished to show one's approval, quote, Du bist ein niederträchtiger Mensch, unquote. present meaning, quote, you are a low-thinking person, low-minded, vile, unquote. This was possible until the middle of the 18th century. Ein niederträchtiger Mensch was until that time an affable, amiable person. He was being praised, given the highest praise from a certain point of view. Again, I do not believe that many people can still derive the right meaning from reading an 18th century literature about an ungefährlicher Zahl, quote, a harmless number, unquote. Ungefähr now means approximate, not undangerous. We would say today, quote, a number that is approximately correct, unquote. An ungefährlicher number was simply an approximate one. Further, what would modern minds connect with the common 18th century expression, un artiger Pflaumen, quote, naughty plums, unquote, un equals not, art equals type, sort, variety. Un artiger plums are those that do not show the sp- specially typical marks of their kind, because they are an unusual variation. Only when we acquire a feeling for the fact that such changes take place will we understand other changes that are not so obvious. For instance, our word schwierig, difficult, you know the shade of feeling with which it is spoken, it was formerly used only with the conscious intention of expressing full of schweren, full of Geschwura, swellings, abscesses. Therefore, if you found something schwierig, you wished to express the feeling that this would result in abscesses, a very pictorial, vigorous expression to connect with our word schwierig. Such things fall totally outside our modern nuances of feeling. They prove how wrong it is to judge language in a pedantic way without recognizing the reality of language metamorphosis, something also evident in dialects. Today, when offering a guest a meal with many courses, you might tell him not to eat too much of this or that, because other dishes are coming for which he should save some appetite. You might say, quote, please don't eat too much, there's a good dessert coming, unquote. <clears throat> But in one region of the German-speaking lands, it is possible to put it, Is von dieser Speise nicht zu viel, es gibt noch etwas hinten auf. Quote, Don't eat too much of this, there's still something coming in the rear. Unquote. Aside, etwas hinten auf in modern German carries the connotation that a spanking is in the offing. Unquote. Uh, end of aside. In another dialect, it is possible to say, quote, Oh, these are good children, die schlachten sich. Unquote. Quote, they slaughter each other, unquote. This meant that they take after their good parents, are cast in the same mold, aside vom gleichen Schlag sein. End of aside. It is exactly this kind of example that points up the living interchange between inner sensitivity and the external image in our feeling for language. Sometimes this shows up in extremely important matters. For instance, you will find a statement of Goethe, made in his later years, characterizing his work on Faust. It has played a most significant role with the Faust commentators. In Goethe's last letter, March 17, 1832, addressed to Wilhelm von Humboldt, he characterized his work on Faust as remarkable wenn seit über 60 Jahren die Konzeption des Faust bei ihm jugendlich von vorne herein klar 
die ganze Reihenfolge hin weniger ausführlich vorlag. Parenthesis, when for more than sixty years the conception of Faust has been clear to me from the beginning, first as a young person, the whole sequence, however, less fully developed in close parenthesis. Many Faust commentators concluded from this that Goethe already, as a young man, had a plan for the complete Faust that he had conceived clearly from the beginning, von vorn herein, and that the later work was merely a kind of working out the details. And much that is unnecessary and untrue in their characterization of his work on Faust has originated from this interpretation of the passage, for only since Fresenius published his findings about the significance of Goethe, for Goethe, of the phrase von vorne herein, Quote, in from the front, unquote, that is, at the outset, has it been possible to understand Goethe's words. Footnote, August Fresenius, born 1850, see Rothstein of the Course of My Life, pages 221 to 223. And that's, sorry, the Course of My Life, and not the auto, now called the Autobiography, I don't have the page numbers for that. End of footnote. When he had found something of importance, Excuse me. All this had special meaning for me because I worked with Fresenius. Footnote from 1890 to 1897 in the Goethe Schiller archives in Weimar, as editor of Goethe's scientific writings. <coughs> End of footnote. When he had found something of importance, it often took decades before he did anything about it. Therefore, I pressed him to publish this, for what he had to say was extremely important. You can put together all the passages of Goethe using the phrase von vorne herein, and you will find that he never uses it in any but a spatial sense. If he said he had read a book von vorne herein, he meant that he had read only the beginning pages. It can be clearly shown that he had in his youth a clear conception of the first scenes of Faust. Here then simply a correct understanding of word usage explains Goethe's work. From this phrase you can see that what he could visualize spatially has for us become abstract. Von vorne herein, he always used visually, spatially. Much of Goethe's charm and attraction for us is founded on his going back to the original qualities of the language creating genius. You can start out from Goethe's language and from there search your way into Goethe's soul, instead of proceeding only materialistically as modern investigators do and you will find there important criteria for freeing philology from rationalistic materialism. <clears throat> it is good to look for help from such sources also. In many ways, there are no longer, excuse me, in many ways there no longer exists such language that expresses a combination of shades of feeling and sound. We can still find this sometimes in dialects, which also have it in themselves to bring the visual to expression. For instance, you will find here and there in dialect, more often than in educated speech, the phrase unter den Arm greifen, quote, to help someone, unquote, literally, quote, to reach under his arm, unquote. This simply means to come to the aid of a person who needs help. Why? Because a young person, in offering a hand to someone elderly, who can't get about so easily anymore, reaches under the other's arm to give support. This active image was transferred then to any helpful act, exactly as it was with the expression, Lecture 2, quote, to wipe the night sleep out of our eyes, unquote. So it is with the act of giving help, a single specific procedure chosen to express visually a more abstract generality. Sometimes the genius of language was no longer able to retain the visual element. Then also from time to time, Imagery was retained in one instance, cast off in the other. There still exists today the word lauschen, quote, listen with inner attentiveness, unquote, for a certain kind of listening. <clears throat> the Austrian dialect also has a word related to lauschen, losen. We not only say in Austria, when we want to make a person listen, hör einmal, quote, unquote, listen, but also los amol, hearken. Losen is a weaker but still active listening. Educated colloquial German has retained Lauschen. Losen is a cognate with the feeling of a somewhat weak activity, even with a certain sneakiness, pointing to a secret kind of listening. 
in a sense Lozen was taken on the meaning excuse me, has taken on the meaning of forbidden listening. For instance, when a person puts his ear to the keyhole or listens in when two are discussing something not meant for his hearing, then the word Lozen is used hearken. Only after becoming sensitive to the feeling element in such sound sequences can one proceed to develop a sense for the basic sounds, the vowels and consonants. In the Austrian dialect there is a word, Arnel, for grandmother. Do you perhaps know the word Arnel? A more general term is Anfrau, parenthesis der An, A-H-N, die Anna, male and female grandparents, progenitors, close parenthesis. In Arnel you have Anna, combined with an L. If you want to understand what is happening there in the realm of speech, you must swing up to a heightened feeling of L as a consonant. Feel the L in the suffix lich. Parenthesis ly as in friendly. See lecture two and lecture four. Close parenthesis. In which I have explained that it originated from like l e i k. It is somehow related to the feeling that something is moving about. That this moving about has to be imitated in the language. An Arnold is a person who is clearly old but who makes the impression of being lively and mobile. You hardly notice the wrinkles in her face. You see the character of L as it is used here. Take the word schwinden, quote, dwindle, fade, unquote, to go away, to make a thing go away so that it can't be seen anymore. Now, figure that I don't really want to make it go away, but I want to cheat a little in seeming to make it go away. I want to effect something that is not a true, honest disappearance. But I would also feel a moving around, an L, as in Arnel. And there is the word Schwindeln, to swindle. The L makes the difference. You can feel exactly the subtly nuanced value of L by going from Schwinden to Schwindeln. Side parallels in English would be tramp, trample, side, sidle, tread, treadle. Uh, end of aside. If you dwell on these thoughts, your rhythm will become completely natural. You will feel that your rhythm springs from our ancient original relationship to the sound elements of words, which, without the sound elements, only movement can bring to expression. If you can feel such a thing, then you will be able to sense precisely how, for instance, in the vowel U, there is an element of moving close together, snuggling close together. Look at how you do the oo in your rhythmi. Arms and hands are brought close and parallel to each other, as in the written letter. You have the moving together, the closeness of the gesture, so that you can say in the word muter, mother, someone who usually you usually come close to. It would be impossible to have an a ah or a eh as the strong vowel in the word. The o of mother is a gesture of affection. You can't imagine saying meter or Mater, mater shows that the language in which it occurs, Latin, was already a weakened one. The original word was muter. I have shown you with all this the path of the genius of language, a path on which a barrier was erected. I have said between the sound element of a word and its meaning. Now let me read that again. I have shown you with all this the path of the genius of language, a path on which a barrier was erected, I have said, between the sound element of a word and its meaning. <laughs> they were originally closely united with each other in subjective human perception. They have separated. The sound content descends into the subconscious. The mental picture ascends into our consciousness. See Lecture 4, page 5960. Much has been cast off that can be perceived just there, where human beings originally lived closely connected with the things and activities around them. When you go back to earlier times in language development, you find the altogether remarkable fact that the original forms of language take us completely out into factual reality, that there exists on the primitive levels of language formation a fine sense for actual facts, and that the people who live at this level live closely connected with things and with everything that goes on with things. The moment this living connection is broken, the sense for reality becomes hazy 
and people live in an unreality that expresses itself in abstract language. In the original Indo-European language, there were, there were three genders, as in Latin. We still have three genders in German. You can feel three different qualities expressed as masculine, feminine, and neuter. In French, there are only two genders left. In English, only one. This shows us that the English language has divested itself with a grand gesture, one could say, of the sense for reality, that it now merely hovers over things, but no longer lives in actualities. On that early step of human development, when the gender of words was being formed, there still existed a primitive clairvoyance. A living spiritual quality was perceived within things, der zona, sun, masculine, and dimont, Dimond, moon, feminine, which later was reversed to Dizona and Dermont. In modern German, sun is feminine, moon is masculine. could never have come about in the older Indo-European languages had the elemental beings living in the sun and moon not been experienced as brothers and sisters. In antiquity, the sun was felt to be the brother, the moon the sister. Today, in German, it has been turned around. The day was perceived as the sun and the night as the daughter of the giant Norvi. This definitely originates from primitive clairvoyant vision. The feeling for the earth at that time was very different from the geologist's perception of it today, when they would actually have good reason to use the neuter gender and speak of das Erde. Aside the correct form in modern German is die Erde, feminine, end of aside. People nowadays no longer sense that the earth in fact is Gaia, for whom the masculine god is Uranus. The people still had a perception of this in the areas where the Germanic language was originally formed. In any case, there were shades of feeling arising out of the close connection with the world outside, and these were the source for determining gender, for deciding characteristic gender. The elephant, der Elefant, was considered strong. The mouse, die Maus, weak. Since a man was perceived as strong and a woman weak, the elephant was given the masculine gender, the mouse the feminine. <coughs> the trees of the forest are usually feminine, because, for the original perception, they were the dwelling places of female divinities. Of immense importance, because it points to a deep aspect of the language genius, is the fact that alongside the masculine and feminine genders there exists a neuter gender, we say der Mann, the man, die Frau, the woman, das Kind, the child. The child's gender or sex, aside the German language, uses the same word Geschlecht for both, and of aside, is not yet articulated, has not yet reached complete definition, is in the process of becoming. When the neuter gender arose, <coughs> it came up out of a certain mood in the folk genius, a feeling that anything given a neuter gender would only later become what it was to be. Gold does not yet have the special characteristic it will have some day. It is still young in the cosmos. It is not yet what it is destined to be. Hence it is not der Gold or die Gold, but das Gold. On the other hand, we can look at what comes about when the visualizing power that could characterize gender disappears. We say today, die Mitgift. Parenthesis dowry, literally, quote, with gift, unquote, close parenthesis, which shows a clear connection to an earlier word, die Gift. We also say today, der Abscheu, parenthesis, aversion, literally, away shyness, close parenthesis, which is clear evidence of an earlier word, der Scheu. Both of these deductions are correct. Der Scheu and die Gift have gone through a subtle change in connotation. The gift in early times simply meant the non-committal act of giving. But because of what some people have given and what was also in Faust's opinion harmful to others, the word has changed its meaning and has been applied to gifts that are objectionable, losing the connection with the original gender characteristic. The result is das Gift, poison, neuter gender. When a person once was called Scheu, he was considered 
as having strong feelings, as being firm in himself. I'm pronouncing shoy, the word is S-C-H-E-U. I believe that is pronounced shoy. I might be wrong, sorry. And my side. When the word became weak, it became dishoy, shyness, feminine. That our language has become more abstract, that it has released itself from its interweaving with outer reality, can best be understood from the fact that the ancient Indo-European languages had eight cases, nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, vocative, ablative, loc- locative, and instrumental. Aside, German has retained the first four. English has one case form for nouns, except for possessives, usually adding s, and two forms, you, your, or three forms, they, them, their, for pronouns, end of aside. This means that not only was the position of a thing expressed as it is done today with the first four cases, but people were also able to follow other relationships with their feelings. For instance, to do a thing at a certain time, we can express as diesen Tag, quote, on this day, unquote, accusative, or dieses Tages, Tages, quote, of this day, unquote, genitive. No longer do we experience the active helpfulness of the day, of the time of day, or of a special day in particular. No longer do we have the experience that whatever is done on the 2nd of January 1920, for instance, could not be accomplished later, that time is a helpful element, that time is involved in something that helps us. There existed a sense for all this in earlier ages, when the instrumental case was used, hu tagu, we would have to say something like durch diesen Tag, through this day, vermittelst dieses Tages, by means of this day. Hyutagu has become the word heute, or quote-unquote today. The old instrumental case is buried in the word, just as hiujaru or yaru has become hoyer, this year. But German has retained only four cases and cast off the others. You will understand from this how continuously language becomes more and more abstract, and how the capacity for abstract thought, with its definite lack of a sense for reality, has been taking the place of an earlier connection with the real world. This is what language reveals.